Hello and welcome back to revise GCSEhistory.co.uk, the number one place for your GCSE history revision. This is the fourth video in the topic 20th century medicine, and in this video today we're going to be looking at the impact of World War I and World War II, and how the two wars during the 1900s affected the development of medicine and health. So, firstly, let's look at some key dates. It's useful to be aware of when these two wars were. Sorry, let's underline that a bit better. So, World War I, that was from 1914 to 1919. World War II was from 1939 to 1945. So, these two world wars, these two massive wars, were fought during the first half of the 20th century. And in this video today, we're going to be looking at their impact on medicine and health. Okay, let's start with World War One. So, how did the First World War influence the development of medicine? Well, World War Two was a massive conflict. There were more soldiers killed and wounded than ever before in any other war. New and deadly weapons were first used for the first time ever, and bullets and shrapnel gave severe injuries. How did medicine develop then? Well, battlefield surgery. Many soldiers were wounded, and this gave surgeons the opportunity to experiment with new techniques and methods of treating wounds. Powerful guns were used, and these caused more severe injuries, so more severe Surge, uh, more sort of intense and more serious surgery was uh, carried out than ever before. Uh, as normally, people could probably get away with doing sort of simple surgery, but the very powerful weapons used during World War One meant there were more serious and severe wounds, and this meant that more complex surgery needed to be carried out. Surgeons developed new techniques of repairing broken bones and performing skin grafts. So, that later formed the basis of plastic surgery. So, surgery after the war. We're looking at surgery a lot so far, aren't we? Okay. So, surgeons who, lear who learned skills as battlefield surgeons set up as specialist surgeons after the war. Surgeons searched for better ways of preventing infection caused by deeply lodged bullets. The war inspired many doctors to search harder for an effective way of fighting infection. So it gave them some incentive to work harder and some urgency to do so. So, the practice of blood transfusion. If you remember back, we've looked at this in a previous video, but we're just going to mention it very briefly here. So, blood transfusions, if you can remember, were effectively used for the first time during World War I. Improvements were made in storing blood. Whoops in storing blood as on-the-spot donors were impractical and a better method of transporting it was developed. Alright, so x-rays, if you remember back again, we did mention this in a previous video, but we'll mention it very briefly here, just to remind yourself. So, x-rays were used during the war to find bullets and shrapnel that was deeply lodged in the body, and that would have otherwise caused fatal infection if it wasn't removed. X-rays improve the success rate of surgeons in removing deeply lodged bullets and shrapnel from the body. And as I've just been saying, we talked about the development of blood transfusion and X-rays in a previous video, and if this sounds unfamiliar, head over to the website revisegcsehistory.co.uk, click on the 20, 20th Century Medicine video collection, and watch the video on X-rays and blood transfusion for that to be explained more detailedly. Detailedly? In more detail, I meant. So, how did the First World War improve surgery? So, remember that we've already looked at x-rays and blood transfusions, but there is a third way that the First World War improved surgery. So this is the third way. There's three main ways. Three main ways. So, the first would be x-rays, Second, blood transfusion. Third is improvement in fighting infection. Whoops, improvement in fighting infection. So the practice of aseptic surgery was whoops, 
a septic surgery was not suited to the battlefield because it was very difficult to prevent infection of wounds under enormous pressure and with a growing number of casualties that needed to be treated as quickly as possible. Wounded soldiers often developed gas gangrene from bacteria that was trapped in their clothes and th so that was a very uh, awful infection in the trenches. And surgeons actually developed a way of cutting away infected tissue and soaking the wound with a saline solution. So rather than aseptic surgery, we're we're reverting back to uh sorry, we're reverting back to antiseptic surgery, killing germs rather than making sure they're not there in the first place. And this was made possible by experiment and a massive number of casualties during wartime. So that's another way that the First World War improved surgery. So, World War I also led to imp other improvements in 20th century surgery. So what were these? As well as improvements in x-rays, blood transfusion and fine infection, there were other improvements too. New techniques were developed to repair broken bones. Improvements were made in grafting skin, which later formed the basis of plastic surgery, and surgeons successfully attempted brain surgery. Surgeons who learnt their skills in battlefield hospitals utilised their skills back home after the war, so it improved the practice of surgery after the war. So, we've talked so far mainly about the First World War and its effect on the development of medicine and health, mainly on the development of surgery. So, what was the impact of the Second World War, which dated from 1939 to 1945, on the development of medicine and health in Britain? Let's have a look. Whoops. So, blood transfusion. There was, it was further improved during the Second World War, and civilians could now sign up to donate blood. So, we had blood donors. Hygiene. Government posters were put up and these encouraged and educated people on basic health and hygiene. Drugs. Penicillin was developed. So it was discovered in 1928 by Alexander Fleming. We talked about this last video. And then it was developed in the 1930s by Howard Florey and Ernest Chain. And in the 1940s it was finally mass produced. And there was enough penicillin to treat allied wounded soldiers on the D-Day invasion of Europe in 1944. Diet. Rationing, or, uh, rationing improved people's diet. So it improved some people's diet. If, uh, I'm assuming that everyone's familiar with what rationing is. That's where the government give a certain amount of food to people. Everyone gets the same amount of food uh, per week and they collect it. They can't have as much as they like as they probably could before. So this might cure obesity and that sort of thing. But also it gave people the vitamins and calories they might not have received otherwise. It gave them a sort of balanced diet. That's what we'd call it today. An extreme example, if uh, some people just ate, uh, ate cake all the time, they didn't eat proper food, uh, rationing made sure that they were eating properly and eating the vitamins and calories that they needed. Government posters encouraged healthy... I'm going to try again. Government posters also encouraged healthy eating. Let's have a look at something else then. So, poverty. 1.5 million children were evacuated from cities to rural areas to protect them from the blitz bombings. And this highlighted the contrast between the living standards of the rich and poor, so that sort of raised awareness of how people, uh, how the poor were living. It sort of broke down social distinctions too. People saw that they're all one together, there's no separation between rich and poor, because they sort of helped out in times of desperation. So it broke down social distinctions and also raised awareness of how bad some people's living standards were. So it increased the commitment of the government to fight poverty more seriously after the war. And that is reflected by the later introduction of the NHS and the Labour election win in July 1945. We're going to talk about this more in a later video, these two things. So surgery, further advancements were made in the use of skin grafts and the treatment of burns during World War II. So that 
This slide here gives lots of information on how the Second World War affected the development of medicine and health. It's quite, dense, it's quite densely packed full of information. I think it was as a spider diagram in the main textbook, and I've just took the information from it and put it on on this slide. So make sure you learn the key points from this slide. Okay, so this slide, don't be <laughs> alarmed about how much information is on it. We're going to read through it together. So, how did the Second World War change the government's role to providing public health? So here, we're talking more about liberal reforms, as it calls it in the textbooks. And we're going to talk about this at the end of this video, and it also links over to the beginning of video 5 in the topic of medicine in the 20th century. So, the shortage of food in World War II and rationing. So the government seemed determined that children should be fed properly, local authorities provided more free school meals, and free milk for school children. The government decided that every child should be provided for, every child should be provided for, no matter if they were rich or, for, or poor, because they were the future of the country. They would become adults and run the country one day. Some families would have needed more help than others. So, the shortage of food and the sort of rationing uh, during World War Two meant that after the war, the government realised that they should give poorer children free school meals, free milk should be given to school children, and they should help provide for every, ch every child, because they were the future of the UK. Heavy bombing uh, during World War Two meant that the government set up emergency, the emergency medical service to cope with casualties of the heavy bombings. All hospitals were placed under government control. As before, there was a quite a range in the uh, quality of treatment provided in hospitals. The rich were treated in proper private hospitals, and the poor were often treated in workhouse infirmaries. So, during the Second World War, all hospitals were placed under government control. The government measures were popular and workable. People began to think that the government should control all hospitals and offer free treatment even after the war, and this led to the introduction of the National Health Service in 1948. And as I said, this slide really does link over to the next video, and we're going to be talking a bit more about that in the next video. So, the evacuation of children in World War II, as we've previously said, 1.5 million children were evacuated to rural areas from city areas during World War II. So people people looked after the evacuees from inner cities. Sorry, I'll start again. People who looked after the evacuees, evacuees from inner cities were shocked at the state of hygiene and habits of some of the children. Some poor inner city children didn't know how to brush their teeth. That's just a little example of how bad uh, the living conditions really were in rural areas, and this shocked many people in. Sorry, got that wrong. This is just an example of how bad the living conditions were in city areas, and that really did shock some people who lived in the countryside. People began to think that the government should play some role in ensuring the well-being of children, and the war changed attitudes. It became the government's duty to look after its people. Evacuation also broke down, broke social distinctions, distinctions, if I'll just fit that on, you know what I've said anyway, broke down social distinctions. Before the war, the lives of the rich and the poor were very separate, but evacuation sort of forced the rich and the poor to mix together and they were very shocked at how different people's lives were depending on social class and their wealth. Okay, so that's all the information we need to look at for today's video. Here are four quick questions based on all the knowledge we've looked at today in this video. You may wish to pause the video in this place and have a go at the questions yourselves. If not, carry on watching and you can do them with me. So question one, give two ways in which surgery developed due to World War One. So the there was a development in skin grafts. Which later formed the basis of plastic surgery, and a development in 
brain surgery also. There's also, uh, you may wish to say, x-rays there. They're just two examples I can think of. What disease did wounded soldiers in World War I often develop from the bacteria during surgical operations? It was called gas gangrene. And that developed from the bacteria that was in the soldiers' clothes. How did evacuation help to improve public health? It highlighted differences. There's a lot you could write for this. Between rich and poor. I'll just write that for one. The government saw that it should look after the well-being of children, as they were the future of the country, all that sort of stuff. Uh, how did rationing during World War II improve public health? Well, it gave people a balanced diet. I'm just going to say for that one. And after World War II, as I said, more free school meals were set up, free school meals, and uh, free milk after World War Two. Alright, so there are the answers to the quiz questions for today's video. Thanks for watching this video today, and in our next video we're going to be looking at the introduction of the NHS and liberal reforms in the 20th century. Thanks for watching, and I hope to see you again very soon over at my website, revisegcsehistory.kdk.